I'm, I'm very excited this morning to um, uh, be sharing some time here with uh, an alumni of Central Harden, Mr. Tucker McEwen. Uh, Tucker, 1999, right? Yep. All right. Tucker was a, a proud Bruin. I uh, spent, uh, had some great years here that he's going to tell you about. But uh, even more exciting uh, for my students, I think, today is hearing some about the, the life you've had the opportunity to live since you uh, left the halls of Central Harden. Uh, so, Tucker, uh, I thank you very much for taking the time out of a very uh, busy life and uh, spend some time with us here at Central Harden. But would you just tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing now and how you kind of got where you are? Okay. Um, so, currently, my job is uh, I'm a, a, a Air Force pilot with uh, the 89th Airlift Wing at Avengers Air Force Base just out of, outside of Washington, D.C., uh, my very job is flying the vice president, uh, first lady, secretary of state, uh, a lot of other senior officials, but primarily the vice president. Uh, we, we fly under the call sign Air Force Two. Uh, the plane I fly is a, a Boeing 757 that's configured for with a lot of communications equipment and uh, room for conferences and uh, meetings and stuff in the back. So it's a it's a again it's called a C 32 is what the, the Air Force designation for it, but it's a basically a 757 that you could go fly on on Delta um, and fly across the country on. So um, as a, uh, as a, uh, well, I, I still call him coach Isaacs. It's still, still thinking he was coaching football back when I was at Central Harden, but as a uh, coach Isaac said, uh, I graduated from Central Harden 1999 uh, when I was there, played football and baseball. Um, lo long story short, so, sometime my senior year, uh, my, my mom knew that I'd always wanted to be an Air Force I hadn't actually done much research into how, how to actually make that happen. I didn't know anything about the military. Uh, she came home one day with a, with a Air Force ROTC scholarship uh, application. We had a, we had some friends that there had a son going to the University of Notre Dame on a Air Force ROTC scholarship. So I said, yeah, that sounds great. I'm sure, you know, the Air Force is the way to go if you want to be a pilot, right? So. I applied, and, and the Air Force, I, I did a, 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 this interview process with the, uh, the, the colonel who was the detachment commander. He was an Air Force colonel who was working at the Air Force ROT, D, uh, ROTC detachment at the University of Louisville. Interviewed with him, uh, waited a few weeks, and found out they, they gave me a full, full college scholarship to any, any uh, college in the country that had an Air Force ROTC program. So that was pretty exciting. Um, so I looked into that uh, again. I played football. And I was I, I wanted to keep playing football in college. So I had talked to the coaches at Georgetown College, just a little small small Baptist school. If any, any of you guys are familiar, uh, they they offered to let me come play football there. And fortunately, they had what we called a, a crosstown program, so I could attend Georgetown College. The Air Force would pay for that tuition, and then I just had to attend classes a couple times a week over at the University of Kentucky, and. Uh, worked on becoming an Air Force officer there. So so I did that for four years. Um, summer, we had uh, some boot camp type stuff. There was always Air Force activities to do during the summer as well. And then, like I said, two to three days a week, I was doing ROTC classes over at Kentucky. Uh, so did that for four years. Uh, graduated from, from Georgetown with a degree in physics. And I was fortunate enough to be you know, I worked pretty hard at it and uh, was fortunate, fortunate enough to be selected to attend pilot training. So as soon as I graduated, I got, got my commission as a second lieutenant in the Air Force. Um, they actually paid for me this. My first assignment was actually stayed at, at Kentucky. Uh, for in, I was working at the ROTC detachment, but my primary job was getting my private license over at Bluegrass Airport. So I got my private license uh, in a little Cessna. And then they sent me over to Columbus, Mississippi uh, for, for pilot training. Flew the, uh, the T-37 there. This is an old jet that dated back to the 50s. It's, it's long retired now, but it was a little side-by-side -side jet trainer. We did aerobatic training, flying upside down, uh, barrel rolls, all this cool stuff, and just learned the basics of the fundamentals of flying. Did that for about six months, um, and then... At about halfway through training, you kind of decide what kind of planes you want to fly. Obviously, the Air Force has big planes. They have refueling planes. They have um, bombers, fighters, and then they have uh, C-130s. They have cargo planes, and, and to me, that was a cool mission, which I'll talk a little bit about more, but C-130s are propeller planes that 
carry a little bit of cargo and people and you just fly around uh primarily what you what you uh what you may think of with c-130s is is airdrop that's our that's our big thing we're known for so if you see a bunch of army guys jumping out of the back of the plane that was that was me uh flying c-130s so i went down to uh actually went to train with the Navy down in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, we had a joint program there where everybody that was going to go fly propeller planes uh, in the military trained with the Navy down there. So I did that for about another seven or eight months and then uh, graduated, got my wings, um, and then was picked for my sur- first assignment, went to uh, Yokota Air Base over in Tokyo, Japan. So for a kid that grew up in Hardin County, Kentucky, had never really seen the world to be, to be thrown into it, um, to go live in Japan was a unique experience. Flew, flew all around the world there. Um, flew all over Asia, obviously, the Pacific, Guam, the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, all, just all over the place. Um, and then while I was there, I also did a couple deployments to Iraq and uh, one, one to Afghanistan as well. So this was, this was 2005 to 2008. So the war in Iraq was, was pretty hot and heavy then. And then... Um, Afghanistan was still pretty quiet then, and uh, but we were air, air dropping supplies to army troops in the mountains of Afghanistan. We were and then flying flying troops and cargo all over Iraq. Um, did that did that quite a bit, and then uh, so three years that that's typical assignment cycle in, in Air Force. You go somewhere for about three years. So I lived in Japan for three years. Uh, then they moved me back to. Uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. I was there for five and a half years. Again, just did a couple more depl- deployments to Afghanistan. Uh, lots of training, flying around the, the, the foothills of the Ozarks there in Little Rock. Uh, did that for five and a half years, and then uh, they moved me over to uh, Ramstein Air Base in Germany. So, again, I love I love foreign travel. Really got, got uh, grew to love it when I, my time in Japan, so I had never been to Europe. So we lived in Europe, flew in, in Germany for a while. Um, again, flew all over Europe, and we did a lot of flying down in Africa as well, which is to me was scarier than flying in Afghanistan, honestly, because they just sent us out to these uh, forward operating bases in Africa, and you're kind of alone down there. Not a lot of security. There's not not uh, the support assets that you have had in Iraq and Afghanistan. So uh, flew all over Africa. Flew uh, took took the airplane into some remote places, landed on dirt dirt landing zones in the middle of the Sahara. So that was pretty cool. Uh, but after 12 years of, of doing that kind of stuff, the C-130, I had, you know, had three kids at this time. Um, I kind of decided that, uh, that, that life wasn't for me anymore. You know, was, that's a young man's game. And I was getting to my mid thirties and I kind of got tired of sleeping in tents. So, um, I applied for the 89th airlift wing. Uh, it's a, a selective interview process. And I had enough time at this point, had a pretty good, pretty strong record that, um, they brought me in for, for an interview and I was selected to fly the Air Force Two. So that brings me to now. I've been here for about five and a half years. Um, I'm one of the, I'm the senior evaluator pilot for the, uh, for the C-32. So that means I, I give everybody else their check rides to make sure they're safe to go fly the vice president. That's basically what that boils down to. So that brings me to now. I've uh, been in 19 years now. So I get to retire next summer. And uh, we plan on moving back home to Kentucky. Um, I applied for a job with UPS. I interviewed with them about a month ago, so I'm waiting to hear back. Um, if you don't know, if, anytime you drive up to Louisville, drive by uh, the airport there, you see all the, the white and brown jets. That's UPS. Um, so hopefully I keep flying, maybe even the same play that I fly now, flying cargo around the world for UPS. So that brings me to now. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Duggar. Um I had some, we, we had our uh, newspaper uh, go out and talk to some kids and uh, get some questions. I uh, actually even had a couple of staff weigh in. Uh, do you mind answering a few questions for them? Absolutely. Yep. All right. So I'm just going to kind of go down my list here. Uh, the first one is actually from one of our teachers, Mr. Wheeler. Um, he wants to know what kind of character traits do you think are most important in a good leader? Um, there, there's a few. Uh, I, I personally like to think of myself as a, a servant leader. It's kind of what I like to do. I'm not the big, uh, you know, hoorah guy that's going to go lead the charge like like William Wallace and Braveheart and rally the troops around me. I'm kind of quiet. So I'm, I, I, so servant leader, leadership means you kind of you serve the people that are working for you. You give them the tools they need to to enable them to do their jobs. So 
uh, helping out with the things that you can, but making sure they're also uh, on top of the game to do their job. Um, uh, communication is a huge skill. Um, if you're if you're a senior leader and you know you're the guy that's in charge, you know this is the the, the technical age we live in. A lot of stuff is done by text message, email. Uh, you got to be able to write. You got to you got to not. You got to sound intelligent for, for people to leave you. If, if you send out a, a mass email to hundreds of people and it's full of spelling and grammatical errors, they kind of look at you like, who's this, who's this guy? He doesn't even, he, he can barely speak, you know? So having good communication skills and then kind of knowing the questions that people are going to ask you as part of communications, right? Like I've thought through this plan here, I'm sending out this plan. What questions are people going to have? I can front with those and answer those questions or, you know, any issues and else what to do. So I, I'd say, yeah, so communication and a willingness to uh, to be humble and serve others is, is two of the biggest traits I think are important for a leader. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Mr. Wheeler also wants to know what it was like to meet some of these uh, important figures that we look at as national leaders. Um, it's, it's pretty surreal, honestly. Um, I don't know if you, uh, so anytime we leave Andrews Air Force Base, um, the vice president has a what has a home in over what they call the uh, the naval observatory. It's over in the the western side of DC, and she has a landing zone there. So she has two. She has a helicopter and a backup helicopter that comes and picks her up. It's a, about a seven minute flight from her residence to the air force base, and she lands right in front of our plane. You know, gets off the helicopter, walks to our plane, and so the first time you see that um, when you're in the seat. And, you know, you're either doing the takeoff and landing and the vice president is, you know, probably back there keeping score on how, how hard you landed or you're in the right seat talking on the radios. Um, first time you, you see that, it's, it was really overwhelming for the, the first several times. And then um, when I started, I was still under the, the Trump administration. So uh, Mike Pence was the vice president. So I flew with him a lot. And he was he was super friendly. He would always come up and chat with us, tell us stories. Um, it, uh, we, we took him down to South America. It was the first big trip I did with him. And every stop he was, he would come in and be like, Hey, yeah, I met with, you know, the president of Argentina, you know, he was, he's really good friends with president Trump. And, you know, we worked on this trade deal and stuff. So it was, it was pretty neat for him to come up and talk to us. And he did a lot. Um, remember that same trip he came up, uh, we were, we flew from Argentina to Chile. So if you look on a map, there's this big mountain range there called the Andes. And it was this gorgeous day. You could see for hundreds of miles. And it was just a straight hop hop up over the Andes. And, you know, some of those mountains are 20,000 feet. So we're, you know, they're not far below us. And you just, it was just this gorgeous day. You could see all the Andes. And I'm sitting there in the, the jump seat. We have the two pilot seats. And then there's two seats in the back. And I'm sitting there. And uh, all of a sudden, I look over. And Mike Pence is sitting next to me in the other jump seat. And he's like, wow, guys, isn't this awesome? You know, so. That's pretty good eat. And um, again, he did that a lot. He always talked to us. And Vice President Harris is always really nice. Always, also really nice. She comes up and talks to us. It's again, it's a little little overwhelming when you you know you see this person on TV every day, and then they're coming up and saying hi, and you know talking to you. And uh, it's 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 pretty cool. It's a, a neat perk of the job to have to be able to talk to those people. Uh, we got a junior named Wyatt Wynn who wants to know what kind of skills you learned in athletics that carried into the military and the rest of your life. Okay. Um, yeah, so I would say the, the biggest thing, I, I grew up playing sports, the biggest thing about sports is learning to be a team player, you know, especially in the military. Every Everything's a team. You got to rely on other people. You got to trust them to do their job. Um, that's exactly, I've, I think football is the, the greatest um, corollary to being in the military where everybody has a job to do. And if one guy doesn't do his job, you know, the left tackle's not, not blocking his guy, the quarterback gets, gets sacked and takes a shot from the backside and he's hurt. He's out for the game now. So um, learn how to be a team player and trust, and trust your people and build camaraderie with them. You know, you can't, you can't, um, you can't be combative and yelling at people all the time that, that shuts people down. Um, it's, it's the same way in the military, you know, there's, there's people doing jobs that I don't want to do. So I actually go out of my way to, to be nicer to them. Like I didn't, I never wanted to be an offensive lineman. I don't want to be the guy that does the paper, you know, the paperwork every time I land to fly. So land from flying. So I try to be extra nice to those people, you know, encourage them, help build them up. Um, so I, I would say that's number one is being a team, learn to be a team player is great from that, uh, playing athletics. Um, Cole Jeffries, also a junior, wants to know what teacher would you think impacted you the most at Central Harden? 
Oof, what teacher at Central Harden? Um, you know, I would say uh, there's there's a couple couple names that come to mind. Angie Johnson was there. I don't know if she, is she still there, Tim. She's our it's Miss Davis to them now, um, but she's a freshman counselor. Absolutely. Okay, she she was great. You know, um, I I I think she was an English teacher. I just I don't remember what she taught me. She was just always the sweetest, nicest person. Um, she just kind of taught you how to how to treat people. You know, treat people the way you want to be treated. I felt like she lived like that. Um, uh, there's, there's several others. Lou, Lou Hatfield was, uh, was, I think my history teacher, but she was, she was, uh, one of my best friends, moms. And she, she, I don't know, she put up with a lot of stuff from us. We, you know, we felt like we could run over, but, um, she was just, she was a great teacher that was always there. And, you know, and then she, she just fought through the, the people being a pain in her neck and, and was, was a great teacher as well. So, um, um, Harper Lewis uh, wants to know how rigorous the training is to become a pilot. Uh, it's it's pretty intense. Like I kind of mentioned, if you if you did the math, um, it, it was about a year and a half from the time I started flying uh, until I had my pilot wings. And it's that the the first times I mentioned the T thirty seven. That's you know flying a Cessna is pretty easy. I think just about anybody can do it. They put you in this jet that, that goes really fast, and now you're flying upside down, wearing a wearing a mask and a parachute, and knowing that um, you, you, you know you're if anything goes wrong, you're sitting on a rocket, basically an ejection seat in that in that plane. So um, it's pretty stressful, you know. The 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 instructor pilots demand a lot from you. You're expected to know everything from day one. It's you know you you can't you can't um, you can't be uh, visionary, but you got to know everything about the plan. You got to know the whole, the, the flight profile you're going to do. So you, if, if you don't have that stuff, that's the stuff you can do at what we call ground speed zero sitting in a chair. You can practice and they can tell if you haven't been practicing that stuff. So, um, it, it, it's pretty, it's, it's very rigorous. Uh, like that takes a year and a half. In fact, um, one of the reasons I'm still in is, uh, back when I think they've reduced the, the commitment now, but you know, most people think of the military as a, a four year commitment. For pilots, that's not the case because they spend so much money training you. It's millions of dollars for every pilot. It was a 10-year commitment after I finished training. So the, the day I finished training, you know, I was already in two years by the time I finished training, and I still had 10 years left on my commitment. So at that point, it's like might as well go go the full 20. But, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's very demanding. And then do you have to get certified on each different style of plane you fly? Yeah, uh, and it depends on what you do. Like the, the C-130, we had so many different missions we did. You know, there's the, the taking off and landing is the easy part. You know, most planes you can learn that in about a month and get fully certified on it. But then after you learn the basics, you know, take off and landing, flying in, flying in uh, instrument conditions or recall when you're flying in a cloud, that's kind of that, – that part's pretty challenging. But as you get – the more time you have, that part's easier. But then you have to tack on um, – we did low level, low level training, uh, formation training. We would fly that plane, and I, I flew the thirteen ship formation one time. Uh, we we do what's called a max effort landing, so you're landing this one hundred fifty five thousand pound plane on a three thousand foot runway, which is pretty small. So that's that's extra training. So the the initial training in the C one thirty is about six months. Uh, the plane I fly now, for for comparison, took about one month to get qualified in it. Now that doesn't mean you're the expert. You got to fly with someone more experienced, but so it's about a month every time you switch planes at, at a minimum. Um, I'm assuming that the, um, Daniel Nall, who's a senior, wants to know about the clearance process to be able to fly the people that are getting on your plane. It's, uh, it's, it's extremely rigorous. Um, so we have, there's, Everybody in the military has, has what they call a secret clearance. And then from there, you get a, a top secret clearance if your job requires it. So I actually didn't have a job that required a top secret clearance until I was a major. And when I, when I put in for that um, clearance, it took two years to get the top secret clearance. And then on top of that, you have what's called a Yankee white clearance. And that means you're, you're um, authorized to, to work directly with White House personnel. So this Yankee White clearance was another, took, it, it takes another six months on top of that. And we have, and so I was actually in our squadron flying the vice president for, we have to do what they call a, basically a temporary Yankee White. 
um, until the, the full one comes through. And we routinely have people that get rejected. And these are people who've been in the military for 16 years. And we don't, we don't get feedback from the, the people that do the adjudicating on that, on why they're denied. But all of a sudden, we've, we've trained this Air Force Two pilot. And now they're like, you can't fly the vice president. So they have to, they have to go switch planes. Um, so it, it takes a long time. It's a it, it, it big end on us because um, we're waiting for people to have these clearances to, to do their job. So it's a really rigorous process. All right, got this one's a. Uh, I, I just had to ask this question because I thought it was a great question. Uh, Harper Lewis wants to know about the quality of the plain food. It, so that's that's actually was a big driving factor of why I wanted to come to this this unit because I mentioned my last job before I came to here. I was flying C one thirties in Africa, and we would take off on a seven day trip bounce around Africa, and as you can imagine, there's not places down there to get get food a lot of times so i would literally pack a cooler and hope i hope i didn't get extended because if i if the plane broke or something i was going to be out of food i'd be eating mres y'all know what mres are meals ready to eat those aren't good for your system so um i got tired of that you know eating eating microwave dinners out of a, a cooler for weeks at a time so first time i came on a, a trip again that trip i mentioned with uh, taking vice president pence to south america they bring out this nice steak on a, you know, a uh, some fine china with the, it's pretty neat. The, the food is really good. It's, it's, our flight attendants do a really good job. They, I mean, they get, they get culinary training. We have a full kitchen in our squadron where they prepare all these meals ahead of time and they're, they're hand selected by the, by the passengers, like what they want. So, um, and it's, it's typically we get the same food as what the vice president's eating. So it's, it's pretty great. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking down my list here because uh, you talked a little bit about Avery Goodman wanted to know about your plans after the service, and you talked a little about that. Hopefully, going to work for UPS and coming home. Um, mm-hmm. Is your is your wife from around Kentucky too? Uh, she's from uh, Ohio. She's from about an hour south of Columbus, but uh, okay. she we met at Georgetown. So she uh, she came to she's a converted Kentuckian. There you she go. came to to see the error in her ways. Hey, Georgetown does it. I married a Hoosier. Georgetown College brings some some great people together. That's awesome. Um, so I'm going to combine two of these. One of them uh, from Wyatt uh, Wynn asked about, have you had any difficult close calls? Um, and then Jack Young asked about Iraq. So I'll kind of put those together. As you look back at maybe some of your combat experience or being in those type of areas, let's say, uh, are there any particular close calls or, or things that you recall uh, during that time that will leave a lasting impact? Oh, yeah. Um, so I, Iraq usually wasn't, a, you know, wasn't a lot going on. Those were pretty vanilla flights most of the time. It's if you don't it, the train at Iraq is just open desert. So everything's flat there. There's not a lot of mountains. To hit. So there's, there's certain parts of the country that, that have mountains, but we didn't really go there. But Afghanistan was Again, and, and Iraq is more, a little bit more, well, a lot more modernized. So um, then, so there's cities and stuff there. Afghanistan is remote. There's mountains, so you're landing on um, dirt landing landing strips in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and like I said, we did a lot. I think I did 30, 30 plus combat airdrops. So you had these arm, these poor army guys living on the side of a mountain, and the only way they had to get food and water was us was us airdropping it to them. So we were um, dropping. Dropping some supplies one day in this uh, this what they call it a forward operating base in the Korangal Valley. Um, there's 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 movies about it. There's a documentary out there called Restrepo. If you ever look up Restrepo, this is exactly where this this mission happened. So these guys, we we were going in every day just dropping them water. They were they were running short of water, so we we're just dropping like thirty thousand pounds of bottled water to them every day. And that it was we had to drop it. Their there was not a there wasn't a proper drop zone. If you can imagine thirty thousand pounds of stuff on the sky, you typically want to be able to clear out a big field, but they didn't have that. So we were dropping it in the middle of their tents, and half of it was was falling off the the side of the cliff down down into the valley. And they were so they were happy to get what they got. But so uh, we went in there this one day, and um, and we're we're talking to there's a there's a controller on the ground with the radio, and he's talking to us and. Um, as you can imagine, we have, we have to slow way down. So we're, we slow way down and we're kind of vulnerable at that point. We got our doors open 
uh, which limits how fast we can go as well. So we can't we can't speed up till they pull out the uh, all the bags that help re release the shoots. So um, we do the drop. The, the controller's really excited. He's like, hey, great drop. We, you know, most of the bundles landed landed on the DC. And we're like, cool, you know. And then, like, three seconds later, he says, um, I, what was our call sign? Um, he said, flash 9-7, the, the enemy is firing at you. And we said, so I, I, I peeked my head to look out the window. And then I realized that's a stupid decision because I have armor behind the window. So as, after I looked, I decided I didn't need to see where the fire was coming. So I sat back in my seat, and we... Again, we, we couldn't we couldn't so the the load boosters got more closed in the back. Um, so that was that was exciting. Um, we get back and the whole all our squad leaders wait the the parking spot for us, which is unusual because um, that was all we heard. He said, "Hey, they're firing at you." But we come to land, we land and find out it started this big firefight. They had shot two RPGs and this big fed weapon at us, and it's it started a big fight between the guys in the base and, and the Taliban. So. That was that was the the closest call I had from a combat perspective. Uh, in in uh, I spent a lot of time in Kandahar, Afghanistan. They shot a lot of rockets at us during certain deployments. They were rocket attacks every other day. Um, I, I, I most recently deployed in 2019, and it was pretty quiet. They would you'd have a rocket attack maybe once a month, and they didn't hit anything. They have, by then they had these guns that shot most of them down. Um, so I'm, I'm getting ready. This is my, I knew this is going to be my last combat deployment. It had been, it had been really quiet. There wasn't much going on in Afghanistan. So I'm, I'm out for a jog in the middle of the night. That was the only time you could go on a jog. And I hear this, this weird uh, buzzer sound. Like I, cause I had, it, the rocket attacks were so few, I didn't even know what the in, incoming warning was. So I heard, I was like, Oh crap, rocket attack. And I looked behind me and maybe a, a half mile behind me, I saw this big explosion. And um, it, it almost hit a guy. It was it was this, it was the first time I had seen one actually hit, and I was like, well, I'll, you know, two days left before my last deployment. It's the closest I came to being hit by a rocket, you know, on, on the middle of the base. So it was those are the two the two closest calls I had. Right. Another year, and then you're and then you're out. Next summer, yeah, plan on moving right. back uh, in time for uh, for my daughter to start high school in. Oh wow. In, uh, we don't know where we're going exactly yet, but if you're going, I mean, with UPS, you'll have plenty to choose from as far as that area, and yep. uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, next time you're in the area, swing by and let me show you through the rent of the addition, and uh, it's they they tore us up. But oh it's yeah, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be amazing when it's done. Yeah, it'll be neat to see. So uh, I'd love to see you. So uh, next time you're in town, if you've got time, I know family is more is the most. Oh no, I've been I've been meaning to make it back. So I've been that's one that's on my list to do when I'm actually in Kentucky permanently. You know, every time I'm there, it's rushing through to see, oh, see yeah. everybody, high school friends, college friends, family. So it's it's tough to get out to do everything. But yeah, once I'm living there, I plan on making it back for for some uh, baseball, football games in Central Hard and. Jackson. Did you get to meet Tom Cruise? I did meet Will Smith one time, though. Will Smith did, uh, if, if you've seen USO tours, um, where they bring around celebrities and come meet the troops, usually around uh, the holidays. Uh, he, he came out to uh, Japan when I was when I was stationed there, and um, they always set up, they always, uh, on Air Force bases, they always try to set up tours of the, the plane, so they had set up a tour of a plane for him to come on. So of course everybody that was available in the squadron ran out to the plane to meet him. So I got to got to say hi to him in the in the plane and take pictures with him and stuff. So that was that was pretty neat. Well Tucker, I very much appreciate the time. I know uh you you stay very, very busy. Um and we we're very proud to be able to call you one of ours. Um, um I do uh, I was blessed to have you in class and I do the one thing as you talked about uh one thing you talked about that I think uh, I remember the most is uh, uh, you talk about being a servant leader and being a man of your word. Um, if somebody were to ask me about you, I think the first thing I would tell them is when Tucker McEwen told you he was going to do something, it was going to happen because he valued who he was and what his and that his word meant something. And I think that's one of the reasons that your class looked at you as a leader is because when you said you were going to do something, they knew they could count on you. So thank you for your service, uh, and thank you for uh, taking the time to meet with us. All right. Well, thank, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it.